Well, predominantly, the biggest challenge that we have today revolves around the kind of input that gives us the uh, product at the end of the day. We are still having yields that are not commensurate with what is obtainable in other climes of the world, not because we can't get those better yields, but we've suffered a long period of, say, degradation. We have, you, you know, you, you, you have more of clusters of uh, smallholder farmers than you have of uh, the large scale uh, mm -hmm. commercial farmers. And then these smallholder farmers, if you check, most of them are also getting old. So new processes and general agri good agricultural practices are not what their forte is. You need to retrain them. So the younger ones going into agriculture that are trainable will help us to achieve this. But primarily, we need to sort out the issue of input that we put into the soil. Now, prior to this time, a lot of people just pour fertilizer, NPK 15, 15, 15 into the soil, soil, and this has led to poisoning, soil poisoning. The Federal Ministry of Agriculture recently started doing a soil survey around the country to determine what spe specific fertilizer is best suited for what area and for what crop. And the way Nigeria is from the thick rain forest in the south, south, southeast, up to the, <coughs> up to the grasslands of the, the savannah area of the north, it's not the same, it's not a one size fit all kind of thing. So this has made it imperative that we first of all understand what's the comparative advantage of this specific area so that you don't scatter your efforts by trying to produce everything in one place. Specific areas can produce specific things. The issue of infrastructure remains critical. Cold storage, dry storage to help boost export. And then the quality of what we produce that has to do with impulse, application of fertilizer, pesticides, and all that, that leaves aflatoxins as end product on what we need, that has to be checked. Mm -hmm. Because these are the things that help reduce the quality of what you're going to export. As I hear you when you say that, we're talking about, of course, quality now that's going to be good enough for exports. Let's not talk about quality that's even good enough for us to consume. I'm not saying we can consume whatever and the world can consume the rest. But then we are producing a lot at the moment. Mm -hmm. yeah. A lot, and we'll talk about the fact that 80% of that gets bad before it gets to the consumer. At Egypt, I'm sorry, at Africa 2017 Investment Summit in Egypt, one of the speakers did say, you know what, how about we concentrate on growing food for our people to eat before we begin to talk about export. So let's even talk about what even comes to the market for you and I to consume. When we talk about food prices, it's all factored into the fact that there are already losses before we get to the market. So let's even deal with this. You do not think storage remains a major issue. I hear you when you say inputs, but what about storage? Storage is, storage, storage is key. Post-harvest loss is the greatest problem that agricultural value chain has in Nigeria. And in solving the post-harvest loss, we also have to look at not just storage, but intermediate processing. Mm -hmm. Immediate conversion of what is produced into a storable and, you know, what can be... If, if we take tomatoes, for instance, what stops us from having solar-powered processing plants close to these areas if we don't have the if we don't have the national grid passing through that area. Now, a lot is being done in that aspect. I'm aware that Henrich Ball is doing a lot on uh, renewable energy processing. I've been doing some work with them on that. And we're looking at clusters where you produce tomatoes, where you can use solar in particular to do intermediate processing. The enablement for this to happen actually has to come from government. If you check the renewable energy aspect of uh, the renewable en energy in Nigeria, the cost is very high mm -hmm. because the duties on it are very high. So are we, is it, is that, I don't think it's out of place for government to decide to weigh down on these duties so that we can achieve food self-sufficiency. I think we're even going too fast. Even before we talk about you know, solar-enabled um, storage facilities, let's even talk about even the packaging to begin with. You just mentioned something very important, the tomatoes. I mean, we consume yeah. that a lot in this country. Have I thought about how we pack the tomatoes to the market? I think that alone the on baskets. its own it just causes the, the loss before it gets to the markets. Yeah, and then we're pressing it trend. in in the baskets. There's a new trend now where you have the plastics, the crates, the crates that um, they have stoppers. So when you put one on the other, it doesn't really press. It has stoppers that holds it. That was that came out of the Lakaji study that USAID help, and uh, Markets too helped do a study in Nigeria as well. Mm -hmm. So it's something we should encourage. The greatest challenge too in deploying that has been when these crates come with tomatoes to the south, they go back empty to the north. So that's the limiting, that's been a limiting factor. 
the uh, the challenges are so clearly, clearly we're not exchanging anything here yeah, we're not exchanging anything major we did not so if if, if it's a two-way journey the cost is shared mm -hmm. and is a lot more reasonable but if it's just one way the cost is much more higher and that impacts negatively on the cost of food but the processing like i was saying you see the if we start from input because the value chain we need to look at the value chain of course completely if you look at the inputs that lead to this tomato varieties that are used for processing have the thicker cortical and are much more fleshier is that what we're planting or do we just go to the market, buy tomatoes, dry it, and then go and replant? So the kind of yields we get are usually very, will still be very low, will still be very low. There are capacities that need to be built over time. There is, it's something that has to be a conscious effort. It's not just, there are too many silos, too many moving parts that are not aligned, you know, to be, you know, that are not aligned in one space to achieve that overall growth. That we want. Do you think it's because you still have a large number of subsistence farmers that you have roughly, you know, large commercial farmers? I do, I do, I do. Uh, but, I, you know, it, it also has a cure. It's not as if it's a hopeless situation. If we can actually get these subsistence farmers into cooperatives yeah. to deal with these cooperatives, then you can, you, you can set up processing plants that belong to those cooperatives. Now they, are, they will end up earning income on two levels. Mm. They earn income from the primary production, they earn income from selling the processed uh, product which comes to them. It's just the, it's just the alignment of the financial, uh, the financial story that helps bring birth this to life. Talking about this financial story, since the buzzword now in the agricultural space is this anchor borrower scheme, everyone has something to, to say about it. Now, how does that really work out with your bank? Are you, is your bank involved in any way? How does that really play out? Yeah, we are, we, we are really involved in the anchor borrower program with NISAL. Okay. And uh, recently we launched a 10 billion line with NISAL to increase. And NISAL is the what now? That's the Nigerian uh, incentive based risk uh, sharing, uh, agricultural, risk sharing and agricultural lending. Mm. Now what they do basically is to de-risk agriculture. Okay. For the banks, banks are skeptical yes. about funding agriculture and very rightly so. So at times the money I will tie down in a three year project in agriculture if I do trading, I turn it 90 days, and you understand. But That's because you guys just got spoiled with oil money. <coughs> Honestly. But we like, like, I mean, like, repented. <laughs> we have repented. No thanks to low oil mm -hmm. price. So, yeah, the low oil price has been yes. a blessing in these guys. Yes, yeah. But, like, you know, the intervention we have with NISA is like, is like um, a handshake. Mm -hmm. We might not be adequately primed to understand the risk at that very lower level. But NISAL has gone that low to say, hey, I'm de-risking this for you and I'm giving you a guarantee. And we're comfortable with the NISAL guarantee. So based on, on the back of that, yes, we'll lend to those smaller groups to make sure that we achieve uh, the food self-sufficiency we are looking at. That's, and then on the anchor borrower, presently we, have, we, are, we are actively playing with NISAL on the anchor borrower in a lot of northern states for grain intervention in grains. You know, the country, they will spend a lot of money importing grains into the country. So if we can actually, if we can intervene in that area and reduce what we spend in mm. importation, we'll be saving the Naira. Now, just in a nutshell, just talk <coughs> me through, you know, your bank setting aside 10 billion Naira to finance various um, value chains um, of agribusiness. What, what part really is, is the 10 billion going to go into? We're, we're, we're not... F we're not leaving it for just one particular sector. There are various, I mean, for one particular segment of mm -hmm. the value chain. Okay. Now, for people that are in production, mm -hmm. let's say we are, they are, we are looking at inputs, we can look at inputs. For people that are in processing, we look at processing. That includes the storage we're talking about. You understand? For people that are at the market end aggregation. So how do we get the money? How do we approach Union Bank for yeah, this? Yeah, you approach Union Bank. Normally, you should have a, you, you, you should have a relationship with Union Bank. Okay. Is NISAL is a joint effort between NISAL and Union Bank. We'll do our normal risk assessment. Okay. Uh, risk assessment. So as a farmer, do I have to go through NISAL or do I just come directly no, 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 to Union Bank? No, no, you come bank? directly to Union Bank. Mm -hmm. We take you to NISAL. I see. Because NISAL will have to understand what you're doing. What do I have to present to you? What do you have to see to be convinced that you're worth, you know, I'm worth it as a well, farmer? As a farmer. Now, if you're coming alone, I assume you're a commercial farmer. Okay. So you have a business plan. Okay. I'll have to look at. I'll have to look at if you, if you, let's say you have a processing plant. I have to look at what your inputs are. Okay. What assured uh, 
listen, do you have for the inputs that okay. we'll make sure that that plant is running? Right. You understand? What market do you have? Because it's actually the market mm -hmm. that gives, that shows me where I my money that. is coming back I from. So that. I need to be able to make that link. But you see, your supply chain has to be fixed in such a way that if you have a plant that has XYZ capacity, yeah. minimum it should be running at 80% capacity. So clearly documentation yeah, has clear, to be there. Yeah, you must definitely. see the end from the beginning. Definitely. Thank you so much. Is a welcome mother. Thank you. The sector lead of agribusiness at Union Bank.